Today on Father's Day, I'd like us to consider God's vision for fatherhood. Springing from Psalm 127, which we dissected and studied several weeks ago during our psalm series, I want to go back to the last three verses of that psalm that John just read, and then also survey several other passages in Scripture that paint for us, when we piece them together, God's vision for fatherhood. Last week, we helped people clarify their vision. Uh, Coming into the optical clinic, their vision was blurry and fuzzy. And when they left, they could see clearly. And I, I really feel that we have an epidemic of blurred, fuzzy vision today for fatherhood. How is a father supposed to know what he's supposed to do and be over the course of this supremely important role that has been placed before him? Most dads look to their dad and they try to mimic the things he did right and correct the things that in their perception he did wrong. That's a good place to start. But I would argue that that's incomplete. Others look at the society and culture around them or maybe a dad in their uh, friendship circle that they admired and try to emulate that. But I think one of the, one of the things churches like ours must do is open the scriptures together for the sake of dads and for the sake of the children being raised in the dad's homes and ask ourselves, what picture does God paint? And how can we make sure all of us see clearly? Now, less than half of the people in this room are dads today. I'm aware of that. But all of us have an interest in knowing what the Bible teaches about any topic that it speaks much about. And so we need to have a thoroughly biblical view of all things in society. And since God invented the family as the first unit, the first building block of society, thousands of years before he invented the church, it's on all of us to make sure that we understand what the Bible teaches about family roles, family responsibilities, and what God designed. You can rest assured that we are living in a day and age when many in the world despise the pattern and design that God has given us. And I would argue that when God designs something and gives instructions for the design of something, he does so for our good so that we may flourish. And as we embrace his design, as we allow his wisdom to shine light on what we do rather than our wisdom shine light on what he says, but instead allow his wisdom to shine the light on our responsibilities, as whether it's as parents or as children or church members or witnesses or citizens in this world, when we allow his light to shine on our roles in life, we tend to flourish when we embrace his design. And I don't think we have to search far for examples of this. We tend to suffer when we reject and defy his design. As I survey the scriptures, I I, I just love uh, the Bible, of course, and I love what the Bible has to say about fatherhood. And today I thought about Joshua saying that as for him and his house, they would serve the Lord. I love the initiative of that. I thought about Job, how he prayed for his children, even after they were already grown and raised. And I thought that is a great inspiring example. I thought about Deuteronomy 6, where fathers are told to teach their children to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love their neighbor as themselves. But today, uh, in an attempt to clarify for us God's vision for fatherhood. There's something for all of us here. I settled on a number of scriptures, and the first one was the verses that John just read. I want to read a second verse to you and then tell you why I'm sharing both of those verses for the first part of the message today. And this verse is Proverbs 17, 6, which says, The glory of children are their fathers. Psalm 127.5 says, happy is the man who has been blessed with the gift of children. So it's talking about the dad being happy because of the children. 
This verse is talking about the children being happy because of the dad. And this leads me to my first truth that helps to clarify fatherhood for us in Scripture, and that is this, the mutual joy in fatherhood. Hey, when God designs stuff, he designs it good. The first six days of creation, the, o- the only six days of creation, he rested on the seventh day. At the end of each day, God said, the Scripture says that God saw his creation and said it was good. When God designs, now when, when sin corrupts things, it moves away from that place of goodness to some degree. But when God designs things, he designs something good. And I know that for the people in this room, everybody in this room has a father. Those experiences of what it means to you to have a father are all over the map. I'm aware of that. We have folks in this room whose relationship with their father uh, may have been non-existent, may have been complicated to say the best, and in other ways, uh, some have been downright painful or abusive. That's tragic. But what we want to ask ourselves today is, what happens when fatherhood is embraced biblically? And the first thing we learn from Scripture is that God has designed there to be mutual joy in fatherhood. Man, kids are a gift from God. That's what that verse says. Children are an heritage of the Lord. I remember holding each of my four children in my arms for the first time. I think I got to cut each of their umbilical cords, all four of them. Kind of a special little dad moment. You're given tools in the, in the uh, operating room and uh, allowed, to, uh, allowed to undertake medical procedures. It probably prepared me for that mission trip, in fact. And um, so... But I remember the overwhelming sense of responsibility along with the overwhelming sense that only God could have created this. And, and probably some of the moments where I felt God's most nearness is in those moments of holding each of my four newborn children in our arms. If you were to add up all of my laughter and all of my smiles over my last 25 years of life, more of them came from those four kids than any other source. And I suspect that if you've been a dad very long, more of the laughter and more of the smiles in your life have come from those sources of joy. There's a mutual joy in parenting, and Proverbs says that it is the, it is the glory of children to have a good and a faithful and a godly father. When When children and fathers can have a right relationship, there's a glory in that that few other things in life can compare to. And I I hope especially the folks in this room that are fathers and grandfathers will, will lean into this, no matter what the status or the current state of the relationship is. And I hope those who are having young children just come into your nest will get a vision for how this can bring great mutual and even eternal joy into your life and into the lives of those that you're raising. Children find joy in their fathers as fathers find joy in their children. There are powerful benefits to the father and child relationship that could only have been designed by God. When a father and child relationship is right, there is this supernatural ability for a child to find their place in the world, to feel secure in the world, to find their way in the world, and ultimately to find their way to God, which explains why the devil is always working to divide fathers from their children and children from their fathers. God wants us to flourish, so he gives us fathers. The devil wants us to suffer, so he tries to divide and tear the relationship. When our girls were uh, like mm, 10 and 8, and we only had two at the time, I thought to myself, parenting is easy. This is like so easy. They're compliant. They're obedient. Um, And then over the next few years, two things happened. We adopted twice, and we went from two kids to four kids, and our older two girls reached adolescence. Do you know that that notion of uh, illusion that parenting was easy evaporated over the next few years? A few years later, I realized parenting is overwhelming, and just with, with, with uh, the demands of it and with uh, navigating adolescence, so when, when kids start having their own ideas, who told them they could have their own ideas? 
But what I've learned is if you'll do the hard work, that joy can still be experienced. It might be threatened at moments, but it can be experienced. As I think about the mutual joy in fatherhood, I'm thinking about our family in particular. Can't help, help but think of our family, our extended family, because this is our first Father's Day without my dad. Uh, my dad went to heaven two months ago today. And uh, he, uh, boy, lo a lot to be thankful for. Uh, we, we grieve, but we don't grieve as those who have no hope for two reasons. Number one, we know exactly where he's at and that we'll see him again. And second, because it was a life well lived, 84 years well lived. He taught us so much. And so even though he's gone, so many of the things that he taught us, we carry with us, whether it's something as simple as work ethic or uh, how to do yard work or mechanic work or household carpentry, or whether it's something like how to endure through the ups and downs of life and the seasons of marriage and family, or the importance of being faithful in church attendance, or even something as, as um, meaningful as giving financially and putting your financial house in order. I remember every Sunday, uh, two things impressed on me, and I hope the dads in this room will, will be challenged by the example of my dad. Two things made an impression on me driving from, from Macon, Michigan to Adrian, Michigan, that 20 miles every Sunday. Number one, my dad was driving us to church. It took precedence over anything and everything else we could have done. And the idea that I could have said to my dad, hey, dad, I want to do something different this Sunday, and that that would have been an option on the table never occurred to me in 18 years. But dad was driving us to church. It was an important thing. And secondly, there was a box of giving envelopes in the, in the glove box. And every uh, week on the way, mom and dad would work together in the front seat to prepare their offering for the Lord's work. And it taught my brother and sister and I that, that this is something that's at the center of our lives. And it's, it's, a, it's the first day of the week and the, the first portion of our income goes to the Lord's work. And the Lord deserves the priority in our lives. Um, I want to show you a couple pictures the, uh, because of the verse in Proverbs we just read. The first picture I want to show you is my dad and mom with their great-grandchildren. Oh, no, this is, this is not their great-grandchildren. This is us. Um, this is the first picture. The second picture is going to be that one. This is me in the middle. You could tell that, right? That's my sister on the left and my brother, Gary, who's over here. Uh, Gary Lauren, we call him, on the left. And that's us. And that's about 1978. You knew that when you see my dad's shirt, right? Um, and uh, that was Christmas. Might have been 76 uh, or 7. But um, this is what I think of when I think of fatherhood, you know? I want you to see the great grandkids. Fast forward from 1977. This is the grandkids. Yeah, 19, this, which is fine. 1977 to 2023. This picture was taken 11 months ago. These are, these are all or most of their grandkids gathered in Fowlerville. What, what do you see on every face, everybody? A smile. Yeah, a smile. Let's look at the great grandkids. That's, those are even bigger smiles, right? And uh, those are the great grandkids that were able to be in town that week in uh, July of 2023. Now we got them all together and we see uh, a larger picture. Now, um, I cut half my family off on the right. I was in charge of aiming the camera and I was, I was over there, but you have to picture me. You see Nicole's right eye? Uh, me and Grant and Monroe are over there too. So uh, anyway... This was, this was not the whole clan, but when, when the whole group gets together, there's 35 or 36, something like that, depending on who had a baby recently, and, um, and there's just a lot of joy. And I've been thinking about that. I've been thinking about the fact that this joy, and I've been thinking about the fact that when you do it right, you can even take that joy beyond the person's earthly departure. Because the joy that we have in our lives connected to that relationship now in four generations extends even though my dad's departed for heaven. And I hope that this is a vision for some younger dads in our church about the idea that relationships are valuable. And when it comes to the blessings that Holly mentioned, blessings like material goods are very small in comparison to the blessings of relationships. And so, we ought to order our lives accordingly. The blessings of relationships like this are more valuable 
than the blessings of fleeting pleasure or a moment of thrill of some kind. And so may we order our lives, prioritize our lives, and discipline our lives accordingly. First of all, in the scriptures, we see the mutual joy in fatherhood. Secondly, we see the divine design in fatherhood. God designs things, and when they function according to his design, they function well. And when we, the designed, seek to defy the designer, we frustrate ourselves in the process, and we forfeit the blessings that come from the design. When you think about the family unit, for thousands of years, the Judeo-Christian principle of a mother and a father engaged with one another and their children, becoming the nest from which a society is produced, allowed places like America and many other places around the world to flourish as that design was embraced. I want to look at Ephesians 6 and specifically think of the dad and the children. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, that thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. That is, do not exasperate them but bring them up in the nurture and admonition or the training and the instruction of the Lord. The family was God's idea. Our world continues to rebel against God in countless ways, thousands of ways. And churches have the opportunity, like ours, to go to the Scripture and look at the design and say, hey, everybody, let's let's embrace this design because we know that as we embrace this design, we can flourish. It's a simple thing, but God calls dads and moms to be an authority. Children are instructed to obey. If your kids don't learn to submit themselves to your authority in your home, they're going to be set up for a frustrating life. I know that some authority has been misused in this world. Much of authority has been misused. And much of authority has been abused. But authority was designed by God. How does a child learn obedience? Studies show that when children come up in households where they learn to follow the legitimate authority of a right parent, they tend to flourish in society. Whereas children who are raised in passive homes where there's very little in the way of guidance, there's very little in the way of authority, there's very little in the way of an expectation of of obedience, there's very little in the way of discipline, tend to not flourish. And I think, again, it goes to the beauty and the genius of God's design. Sometimes I see parents pleading with their children or negotiating with their children or bribing their children to obey. Hey, bro, dad never needed to plead with us that he did to follow the instructions. There was never a bribe needed. Please, I'll buy you ice cream if you'll obey. Are you kidding me right now? This not only was this lost maybe in in the generational transition to today's parents, but it's actually not helping the children. Uh, Why do your kids obey? I I guess because we expected them to. And that's where it starts. The goal of your children being obedient is not to make your life easier, although it will. It's to set a course for them as to how they will interact outside of your nest as cooperative members of a world that's ordered by various authorities in schools, in churches, in governments, and in workplaces. And, and it sets the course for how they must come to relate to God. Because before anyone can experience the thrilling, relieving, saving grace of God, they must first see themselves as accountable for having disobeyed a holy God whose authority is righteous and whose rule is absolute. And if we teach our children that anything goes, 
and we're milk toast. We're setting them up to take God lightly, and we can't take that lightly. There's a warning, though, in this design, isn't there? Verse 4, don't provoke them to wrath. In other words, don't exasperate your children. And why is that warning there? I think that warning is there because a lot of times in the parents' attempt to make sure verses 1 and 2 are happening, we can cross over into an ungodlike authority where we are harsh or we are abusive or we are uh, condescending or we are impossible to please. And that goes to the, the, the fact that parenting isn't easy. It's not easy to always get it right. Much of the right work we intend to do can be undone by the wrong way of doing it as parents. And so we're told to not provoke our children or exasperate our children. This is a little bit of a tightrope for us parents to require obedience, to be, but to be 100% present with love, mercy, and grace as discipline is handed out and as restoration is always present in the midst of discipline. Paul added in Colossians, in his letter to the Colossians, a similar warning to fathers. And in that place, he added some words. He said, don't provoke them to wrath, lest they be discouraged. I've had a few moments over the years in the lives of my four children where I felt like in this moment of authority, they were becoming discouraged. And I tried to discern the difference between just not liking what dad was saying because of a rebellious disposition or losing hope in the relationship and in who they are. And so there have been moments where I had to do the apologizing and the restoration and probably some that I missed. Paul tells us in this design for fatherhood that we must bring them up in the nurture and the admonition, the training and the instruction of the Lord. Hey, dads, if your kids don't learn from you what it means to follow Jesus, they probably won't learn it anywhere else. Our church will work hard to influence the next generation, but we can only echo what you're doing at home because if the message they hear from us about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for them and his being worthy of their obedience and God's way as being the best way, if that's silent in the household, it rings empty in their ears from the Sunday school teacher. If it's defied in the household, it breeds resentment in both directions. And so we must make sure that the church and the household, both of whom have been established by God as institutions for passing the truth to the next generation, are working in harmony with one another. That's the design, divine design in fatherhood. So we see the mutual joy in fatherhood, the divine design in fatherhood, and then we see in another scripture the powerful influence in fatherhood. Proverbs twenty three twenty six, My son... Give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. There's a powerful influence that fathers have as revealed in this verse. Look at the first half of the verse. Give me your heart. Now look at the second half of the verse. Observe my ways. Let your eyes observe my ways. The powerful influence in fatherhood is found based on this verse when we pursue their heart and when we pr provide an example. My son, give me your heart. I would encourage you if you're a dad with kids at home or if you're a dad whose kids have left the nest and you maybe are trying to figure out how you can influence them, I would encourage you to remember every day of their lives that God's called you to pursue their hearts. This verse is a verse written by a father, Solomon, to his son. My son, give me your heart. Actions speak louder than words. So what actions am I undertaking as a dad this week to pursue the hearts of my four children? We can pursue their hearts in hundreds of ways. We can pursue 
their hearts with affection. We can pursue their hearts with affirming words. We can pursue their hearts by spending time in their presence one-on-one -on -one and by speaking into their lives. We can pursue their hearts when we show tenderness, and we can pursue their hearts in hundreds of ways. Someone said love is often spelled T-I-M-E, time. This capturing of their hearts is threatened, but can often be recaptured. We pursue their hearts, and then we provide an example. Let your eyes observe my ways. What are two of the words that children often say to their parents, especially in their first 15 years of life, to their dad? Watch me. Watch me. I'm going to jump into the pool. Watch me. I'm going to do a flip into the pool. Watch me. Watch me on my bike. Watch me play this instrument. Watch me do this routine. Watch me. When Dad, watch me. Dad, watch me. Great words. And it's a joy to watch them. But this verse turns that, those two words around, doesn't it? This verse turns those two words around. The dad is called to live a life that says to the children through his actions, watch me. And yes, sons and daughters are watching their father. S studies show that both sons and daughters have a vital need to watch their fathers and learn from their father's actions. Watch me, kids. I'm going to pray now. And I want you to learn how to pray by watching me. Kids, when kids walk into the dining room early in the morning before everyone's headed off for school and work for the day and they see their dad quietly reading his Bible. That's dad saying, watch me learn from God. When we drive to church together as you did this morning, it's saying, watch me put God as the priority today. Uh, when we love their mother well, we're saying, watch me show you how to have a good marriage. When we apologize to their mother in front of them because we sinned against her in front of them. We're showing them, watch me. I'll show you how to do reconciliation when you've made an error. Sometimes we want our kids to fess up to what they've done. What if they learn that by watching us? When we apologize to them for losing our temper when we shouldn't have, we're saying, watch me show you how to repent. When we tell them something we're learning from God, maybe at the dinner table or maybe uh, with open Bibles before bedtime at some point, when, listen, when we sing together at home or sing together at church, uh, when, when we have uh, the teenagers in here once a month in this auditorium seated near their parents, when they watch the dad with joy on his face sing the lyrics of the songs that are about Jesus, we're saying, watch me, I'll show you how to have affection for God. This is the powerful influence of fatherhood. And then finally, I want to look at Galatians 4 together and see the ultimate glory in fatherhood. The ultimate glory in fatherhood. To see the ultimate glory in fatherhood, we have to look beyond the dads here. And we have to look up to see a father in heaven. Galatians 4, verses 4 through 7, tell us what it means to have God as a father. Please understand, the 8 billion people in the world are not all God's children. They are all God's creation and therefore valuable. They are, they are all God's uh, creation in his image and therefore worthy of respect and dignity. But we're not automatically God's children. Jesus himself said, you must be born again. We come into this world as a part of Adam's family. And we have to experience a spiritual rebirth through turning to him in repentance and faith in order to be brought into God's family through the miracle of the new birth. Galatians 4. When the fullness of time was come, that is, in the grand centuries-long drama of God's redemptive ages-long plan, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, Jesus, made of a woman, that's Mary, 
made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons and daughters. But the Jewish context uses the word sons because of the culture of the day and the, the role of the, the sonship in the family was a meaningful role of elevated inheritance. These verses say that God loved us so much as his created ones who had rebelled against him, whom he had designed for fellowship with him, but whose fellowship was lost through our rebellion and sin, that God sent his only son to trade places with us on the cross to receive the suffering and the judgment for all of our sins so that then we could receive the access and affection that only he deserved as God's one and only son. So God sent his son so that we could become sons and daughters. And verse 6 says, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. The affection that Jesus had with the Father, the affection that God the Son had with God the Father throughout eternity ages past, rejoicing in one another, being wholly fulfilled in one another, in the triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit, the, the joy and the affection and the fulfillment and the thrill of perfect Father and perfect Son, the Spirit of His Son has been placed into your heart so that you may approach God with the same affection and satisfaction and intimacy and access and welcome as Jesus Christ Himself, who in His 33 years here on earth never sinned and always did exactly what was right, living the obedient life that we could never live laying himself down on the cross to pay for the sins that he never committed so that we who committed those sins could be gifted with the innocent life that he lived. And what does the spirit of his son say? What does a believer who has Jesus Christ's spirit in him say, who's now been brought into the same relationship with the Father that Jesus possessed in eternity past? What does that spirit say? The last two words of the verse, Abba, Father. Abba is from a Hebrew centuries old world word that is used only as an affectionate term for father they had the word father which was a different hebrew word this abba was reserved for a special warmth and affection the word father referred to the position abba referred to the affection it's like what we would say when we say daddy or papa. And it refers to the, the closest a heart can get to the Father. And this is what God calls you to. And we know that as believers, we are servants of the Lord. We serve the Lord here. And Neil and his family serve the Lord in the Philippines. But verse 7 says, you are no longer just a servant but a son. And if you're a son, then you're an heir of God through Christ. I know that some folks struggle with viewing God as a perfect father because of the, the absence of a good father in their lives. And for those folks, I want to say, I think of you often, I pray for you for grace, and I hope that you can experience an abundant joy in relating to the perfect father who in every one of our father's imperfections is the opposite. Whatever your dad wasn't, whatever our dad wasn't, he is. And it is perfect. If a father should be faithful, he's faithful. If a father should long for their children's hearts, he longs for our hearts. If a father should care, he cares. If a father should love, he loves. If a father should want to be in their children's presence, he wants to be in your presence. If a father welcomes children into their arms 
as I did this morning. When I got home uh, from the airport last night, the kids were in bed, the, the younger two. And uh, boy, to have them come into my arms this morning, what a satisfying sense. And that's the heart of your father. <clears throat> Fathers risk everything to protect their children. And our father went to great lengths to rescue us from eternal judgment. One of the moments that Cece experienced in Honduras was as she was serving as a, a sort of an usher or a runner, uh, she was dealing with a nurse and an interpreter and a dad who had brought his family in for medical treatment. So she had been escorting folks and she was helping to escort this gentleman. And he was being triaged or interviewed by the nurse and his daughter had already been triaged, and it was determined that she needed a, a shot, I think, to treat an infection. And so his, his young daughter <clears throat> was maybe 100 feet away. If you could picture it, picture an auditorium, maybe half this size, flat concrete floor, four concrete walls, and a metal roof. No glass windows, but some open air windows at the top. This is that church's auditorium where they worship every Sunday with no air conditioning. And um, just like us. Uh, <clears throat> and so picture this room. And picture this daughter being escorted over to another place in the clinic where she'll be seated on the opposite side of the room to receive her shot. Well, <clears throat> most of us have watched a child get a shot before. And it's, it's painful to watch, if it's their first one especially. And this little precious Honduran girl let out a cry Waterworks were flowing, and she cried. And across the room, Cece noticed that when that dad heard that cry, his head on a swivel locked eyes on his precious daughter. And in a matter of nanoseconds, tears began to roll down the face of that father. And that, my friends, is a picture of your father in heaven, whose heart is touched with the feelings of your infirmities and whose heart knows where each of his children are and the tenor of their voice. And when they cry to him, hears, has compassion. And that father couldn't cure that girl's pain that day. We trust she's doing better now after medical treatment. But your father has an ability that father didn't even have, and that is to come near immediately and to meet the needs of his precious daughters and precious sons. I suppose there are two takeaways from today's message. One takeaway might be that a dad in this room is inspired to have a bigger vision for his role in the lives of his children. <clears throat> and somebody else in this room, and maybe some of those same dads would say, what I need to take away from this is how I understand my relationship with God because he's told me how he wants me to envision it. He wants me to envision it as the perfect father between whom there is beautiful shared affection and joy. That's the ultimate glory of fatherhood. And <clears throat> our authority on earth as fathers is temporary. They leave our nest. Our relationship as fathers on earth extends, but in heaven there is one father, and he is good, and he is kind, and he is faithful, and we will all be seated at his table to share his affection for eternity. Because when our kids grow up and embrace the faith, they become our brothers and sisters in this family. And God is our Father.